I'm on. Good. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here as we approach uh, the beginning of a holiday weekend. Uh, in 1919, I'm like a century behind here, as always. Uh, 2010, Catherine Johnson and Rebecca Rudolph founded Design Bitches with a bold and irreverent vision to make architecture significant in daily life. Their multidisciplinary firm draws inspiration from the duel's eclectic expertise in the areas of design, art, and pop culture. Based in California, they collaborate on, inter on an international range of products that scale from brand identity and commercial spaces to ground up residential and cultural buildings. They work closely with clients to develop creative solutions responsive to location and user experience. By experimenting with materials and graphics, they provide durable contemporary designs that wink at history. It's a pleasure to welcome Rebecca to speak tonight on behalf of Design Bitches. This lecture is, of course, part of the Berlaga, the Berlaga keynotes, our ongoing series featuring prominent architects, designers, and thinkers who are at the forefront of design discourse and innovation. Um, it's a great pleasure to, again, welcome you here, Rebecca, and to present, um, well, your work to a different kind of audience than you normally would. So I hope that, um, yeah, well, we appreciate this international platform for you to present your work. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to uh, extend a special thank you to Solomon and the Berlaga for having us. Kathy, sorry she couldn't make it, and uh, she sends her best wishes from LA. As you'll see in our work, we like to shift boundaries between disciplines and find the places where interesting overlaps inspire us to tweak the rules. Outside can be inside, architecture is performance, Graphics are spatial, and pragmatism can be rebellious. Our collaboration as Design Bitches began in 2010 out of a shared desire to expand the definition of architecture. The name itself was a response to the question, what is architecture? It's design, bitches. For us, architecture is all about moving beyond outdated formal boundaries between artistic disciplines. We're inspired by the small surprises we find in the culture of daily life. Pragmatists with a rebellious spirit who search for ways to embed function in clever and unexpected places. By embracing our outside interests, we've been able to develop a unique voice in our work, one that's both surprising and referential. We use it to create our brand of architecture, one that's versatile and accessible to a broader audience. We create work that solves problems with elements of design and wit that challenge users to think differently about how they interact with space. We excel at the exploration of intersections, architecture and interior design, spatial and graphic design, the natural and built environments. We revel in collaborating with designers, artists, and our clients, where the process is based on exploration with no predetermined outcome other than the melding of diverse voices into a surprising and joyous whole. Our clients are creative, from a rock star to film editor, digital designers, educators, and surfing entrepreneurs. They're also pragmatists who are building businesses and homes that need to work. They're dreamers and schemers, and what we share with them is a drive to create something new and unique. Most of our clients are in the business of social engagement, bringing people together. We work with them to experiment with spatial experience and research in real time, designing solutions that work in unexpected ways. There's a consistency to the ideas explored in our designs because we share common goals with our clients. The desire to create spaces that encourage creativity and collaboration that people want to return to again and again, that feel comfortable and challenge expectations. As our projects have grown in size and complexity, one thing that's especially interesting to us is the creation of social spaces 
in neighborhoods that have developed in a uniquely contemporary way, where the housing is built or created before the social and commercial infrastructure is there to support it. Verve Roastery Del Sur is located in the Arts District in downtown Los Angeles, what we like to call a concrete island in the center of the city. It's an area that was formerly industrial warehouses and artist lofts that now has a cultural ecosystem of institutions, including SciArc and the Gallery Hauser and Worth, shopping, restaurants, and housing. For us, the life of the place is an equal character in its story and a crucial element in our design process. We create architectural spaces that embrace and encourage life to happen within them through human interaction and experience. Together with Verve, we shared an interest in creating a place that socially connects people over everyday activities like grabbing a cup of coffee. The transparency of the space links directly to Verve's farm level initiative and the transparency with which they run their business. It's not simply a cafe or a roasting facility or office. It combines all into the central hub in Los Angeles. We had the good fortune of being very familiar with the area, having been architecture students at SciArc, uh, which can be seen from the Verve patio in the early 2000s and well before the arts district had developed into what it is today. What the district always had in abundance is a clever sense of utilitarian experimentation. This inspiration carries through the project as we carved up the height and breadth of the space, creating unusual points of perspective, views, and details. The addition of the mezzanine in both form and placement within the space is key. While it functionally enables Verve to occupy and activate some of the extra height in the space, it also reveals uniquely spectacular views of the activity below. By allowing it to both wrap and project out into the empty space above, it dramatically increases the variety of possible experiences. The conversation pit offers a unique double use because you can either sit within it or around its perimeter. One favorite spot is in the window seat in the conversation pit with its view of the 4th Street Bridge as your backdrop. Across town and on a more urban scale, we're the creative directors and design architects for a project that encompasses re-envisioning a neighborhood shopping district known as Runway Playa Vista. Built during the Great Recession of the 2010s, it was nearly value engineered to death. The mixed-use residential retail complex had a high housing occupancy, but many close or failing businesses at street level. We were tasked with creating a space that could host a variety of activities and bring residents out for more than just running errands, adding a town square in the center where originally there was just a street leading to a parking garage. Working with a team of landscape architects and graphic designers, we envisioned a place that was pedestrian oriented, visually rich, and human scale. By closing off the street, adding meandering pockets of landscaping, areas for eating, drinking, gathering, and play, we brought to life an underutilized space that changes with the seasons and from day to night. There's a distinctly graphic and arts-based approach to the sinus, signage and material surfaces, incorporating murals, high contrast super graphics, and industrial materials not typically associated with this scale of development in Los Angeles. The challenge was not only to get residents out of their apartments more often, but to grab the attention of people traveling by on the boulevard, drawing them out of their cars and into the public space. As part of the runway project, we were given 20,000 square feet of empty commercial space to transform into free market, a cultural hub that combines shopping, restaurants, pop-ups, and events. It offers a unique business model for retailers, many of whom have previously only operated online, with small individual units as well as pop-ups and curated events. We created a village within the space through the insertion of small residential scale volumes that interrupt the previously uniform facade. The retail spaces are positioned in the center 
and can be used as passageways to the bars and event space at the interior. Free Market has added to the transformation of Runway. It's a much more lively place that caters to all ages and has become a bridge between the nearby creative offices and housing. Our interest in experimentation that started to develop in the early restaurant projects and has continued with the urban scale retail developments has evolved into different program types. We want to connect our work to the surrounding city in a way that's open and draws people in with new social spaces that are hybrids of home, work, and school. Nine Dots is a STEM education space in central LA that started as a tutoring center for underserved kids and has expanded to include teacher training and partnering with other nonprofits. At Nine Dots, we focused on strategically inserting volumes and large-scale custom furniture in a way that would allow them to run multiple programs at the same time. Angled walls and sloping roof lines fit together at the new classrooms and offices like a collection of sculptural objects within the larger space, encouraging exploration between and around them. We incorporated angled walls at the office volume to draw you towards the center of the semi-open workspace. Skylights pop in and out of the ceiling plane bringing in natural light and creating curious shifts in perspective. Informally arranged workplaces vary in porosity and degrees of privacy to spur collaboration. Sloping roofs help the classrooms feel taller inside but not imposing from the outside. You can also experience the larger volume of the space and read the connection between the structure and the new insertions. Room size spaces, the maker space, library, and classrooms are sectioned off from the larger whole in a flexible way that allows multiple programs to happen simultaneously and separated groups to feel connected. The strategy that we employed here and in free market is one of playing with scale and feeding curiosity using the negative space and the natural human desire to explore, to encourage collaboration. There's a playful purpose to all the surfaces on both the inside and outside of the volume. They're useful for pinup, projection, and sound attenuation. They add a warmth and a richness of color that allows the social complexity of the Nine Dots community to thrive. In the Highland Park neighborhood in Los Angeles, we breathe new life into a previously neglected historic building, transforming it into a community asset by opening up a closed world for discovery at Figueroa Lodge and Checker Hall. It's located in a former Masonic Lodge on the second floor of a nationally registered historic building with an interesting mix of tenants. There's Burger Lords, a vegan burger shop, a Latin bakery, a vintage clothing shop, a city council person's office all on the ground floor, and a hip-hop producer on the mezzanine above. The Masonic Lodge was in the past a private club, a highly ritualized performance space that we transformed into a public venue. It's now a theater with affordable shows and a restaurant and bar where you can experience culture, meet neighbors, and explore the history of the place. We kept much of the Masonic Lodge's mystic character and layered on top of these details saturated color and a mix of progressive materials, drawing inspiration from the entire lifespan of the place. Artists from the arts and crafts movement at the turn of the century painted landscapes that celebrated the natural environment of the nearby Arroyo Seco riverbed. We drew from this artistic past and contemporary artists that moved in in the 80s and 90s to connect the interior of the space to the natural world. Through color and lighting, the theater has been transformed into a space reflecting the night sky <clears throat> somewhere between inside and out. Saturated color shifts as you move through the rooms from blue in the theater to green in the restaurant, 
with a range in between that draws you intuitively through the space. Details allude to the Masonic history of the flora and fauna of the Arroyo, from mystic eye wallpaper and marbled banquettes in the dining nook to thistles and checkered fabric booths. The new bar in the center of the dining room in the form of a Masonic symbol creates pockets around it for gathering and a whirling flow that now has both a strong center and an occupied edge. We're constantly inspired by nature, finding ways to draw the interior out and connect them to their surroundings, tying a place to its larger context by designing from the inside out. Garden House is a reinvention of a typical Los Angeles bungalow. We took it down to the studs and broke it open, removing a chunk that blocked the connection from front to back and designing the landscape with a wild mix of plants that flow over the boardwalks, creating meandering paths. Working on both the design of the house and the landscape at the same time, we were able to craft the views, opening the corner completely at the kitchen to the new garden and enclosing the more private bedroom and working spaces in solid planes. We wanted the inside to feel connected to the passing of time and the changing of seasons, and for the view from inside to draw you out. The goal with this house was to take full advantage of the lot by creating outdoor spaces that would really be used. We pulled the volume apart, transforming interior walls into exterior walls, creating outdoor rooms that match the scale of the interior volumes. We reoriented the entry so that you walk through the garden to get into the house and studio, creating a new threshold somewhere between inside and out. Materials and bold colors drawn from the plants and sky are repeated equally on the interior and exterior to visually connect the two. We often like to play with using exterior construction materials on the interior to reinforce this connection. The same cement board panels are used on the exterior siding and the kitchen island, and the cedar siding extends into the living spaces. The boardwalks connect the site to the nearby LA River and create a sense that you're near the banks and the water can flow through and around the structures. The landscape adds a layer of wildness and unpredictability that grows and changes over time. Hmm. Technical question. <laughs> The, um, oh, there it goes. How can you mix, oh, you might want to. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let it go for a second. It's not usually that loud. <laughs> How can you mix growth and wildness of nature with buildings on a tight quarters? Living in Venice Beach means making the most of very small lots, knit tightly together with your neighbors. Our clients, a musician, a writer, and their daughter, live a life that's variable and fluid. They often work from home, keep, keep unusual hours, and adapt to different family members and friends flowing in and out for extended stays. The site, while sandwiched closely to neighboring houses, has an incredible sense of urban openness to the sky, with the view punctuated by rows of palm trees. Knowing that the innermost part of the site would become the true center of the house, we created a dynamic connection between the main house and guest house studio through the new interior yard between. Venice Beach is a neighborhood known for both the iconic beach bungalows and architectural experimentation. By maintaining the integrity of the traditional Venice Beach bungalow and adding a bar slid through it, 
the house makes an argument for the resilience of archetypes, playing out juxtaposition in a small house that speaks to modernist volumes. It's at the intersection of these volumes and the layers between them that gives us the opportunity to tweak some rules. The master bedroom behaves as a treehouse overlook while the studio is set back and screened by a dwarf citrus grove at the second story green roof. At the studio, we peeled back the roof from one third of the volume, creating a distinctly different experience on either side of the central yard. We embrace the space between by adding useful pockets between the buildings, maximizing visual space when actual space is cramped by the dense urban fabric. Interior windows have been punched through upstairs volumes, so conversations can be continued down to the main living areas and spill into the yard. The double height room <clears throat> has a sleeping loft that will initially act as a bedroom and can transition into another guest space or office in the future. Proportionally, we've intentionally kept everything, oops, that was a little delay, thoughtfully relative to its surroundings. While carefully crafted, we prefer houses that feel instantly comfortable, not too precious to use. We encourage a little sand tracked in from the beach and enjoy allowing the wildness of life to come in, making a wonderfully rich and vibrant environment. Our explorations into dense urban lots and a quest to evolve the typical American single family house into something more flexible and adaptable to living with multiple generations was the genesis for our contribution to the city of Los Angeles standard plan Accessible Dwelling Unit, or ADU. The city is exploring ways to increase density in response to a housing crisis and allowing people to build an additional small house in their backyard that can be rented out is one potential solution. The city invited a group of architects to propose designs that would be pre-approved and therefore more quickly um, permitted the idea is that by speeding up this approval process, more housing units will be built. Midnight Room is a new guest house and re-envisioning of the family backyard. The existing single car garage was torn down, opening up the lot to make <clears throat> the most of the limited space through a series of indoor and outdoor rooms built to welcome three generations. The design is centered around the connection between the two structures in a mirroring of the program. Cedar boardwalks connecting the two float across the permeable drought tolerant landscape, echoing the bridges on the nearby LA River. Breezes across the pool and scents from the aromatic plants draw the inhabitants out to spend time together. The sleeping and living spaces in the new dwelling and existing house face one another and strengthen family ties while also allowing for privacy and the shared experience of nature. We kept the material palette simple to focus on warmth, natural light, and the intimate proportions of the new structure. Exteriors have been painted a deep midnight blue to help blend in with the night sky and contrast with a warm glow from within. Views are focused toward the garden, allowing the dwelling to be at once a retreat and a gathering space, a place to work and come together with extended family. Our small residential projects are a testing ground to play with form, color, and proportion. With them, we explore ideas about density and scale and how those things affect group dynamics. Small interventions in the city can be as powerful as large ones, and the same applies to the tiniest detail within a space. Button Mash is a collaboration 
between a group of us who came together to make a small disruptive intervention in Echo Park. We worked with a beer nerd, a game nerd, an underground chef, and an artist to transform an unremarkable strip mall into something that reflects the rich artistic inner life of the neighborhood. We carved out a series of interlocking volumes within the space that allow the different uses to coexist. There's a vintage arcade, Asian street food restaurant, craft beer, and wine bar. The angled walls and shift in ceiling planes form shifts in perspective that allow glimpses through and across, but never fully reveal what's on the other side. When you enter through the wallpaper covered tunnel, you feel almost as if you're in another world, the button mash version of the city where different kinds of people, including kids, families, couples, and parties can all coexist. Color is used to define the space without walls. It's saturated, enveloping, and draws you around and behind the bar to a hidden door in the pinball room that leads to a retail store and gallery on the other side. We designed everything in the space with varying scale in mind, embedding references from 80s video games to the nearby police academy and film noir. There's visual texture up close and across the room. We collaborated with an artist based out of Indiana on custom wallpaper and artwork that's incorporated in unexpected places. The result is a kaleidoscopic space that continues to change every time you visit. We often design with proportion in mind and are intrigued by the idea of insertion rather than removal. We use this strategy to study how this affects both activity and patterns of human behavior in space. We were able to playfully exaggerate some of these ideas by collaborating with Google design team on their annual design conference span. Both venues in Tokyo and LA were large open spaces. We translated primitive graphic shapes into volumes and used their placement and scale to create a different rhythm of spaces between and around them. In Tokyo, we used a giant truncated cone overhead to create a place underneath that people could feel comfortable stopping under, tucking out of the way amidst a larger flow of circulation. Large in scale, but light in materiality, it has the effect of stepping under a canopy or tree along a sidewalk. A similar effect was created in LA using a large semicircular bench underneath a curtain overhead in which attendees could pause to check messages at varying vantage points between the workshops. We created custom furniture of varying scales, both in height and orientation, to punctuate the rooms and encourage equity and conversation. Minimalist interior trellises were constructed to punctuate the space where guests were intended to pause. Select edges of the frame structure are highlighted to emphasize the graphic roots of each shape and relate them to the surrounding super graphics. These structures create iconic points of reference and assistance in wayfinding for guests to locate pop-up shops, cafes, lounge spaces, and workshop areas. On occasion, translucent colored panels were inserted overhead to alter the quality of light. We're always searching for ways to create multiple experiences in a single space while embedding a sense of discovery and surprise. The importance of human engagement is a crucial element in our work. Connection both with our clients and the public users of the places we create. Collaborating with entrepreneurs to define the physical experience of a brand is something that we've been interested from the beginning of our practice. Superba was one of our first built projects and it enabled us to test our methodology right from the start by asking, what is the intersection of a brand and a place? It's a three-part project situated within the Venice Beach neighborhood of LA. 
to buildings on different scales, as well as the creation of the brand identity and the graphic design for two restaurants. We have a strong interest in the relationships between 3D space and 2D graphics, and the opportunity to do both at two locations within a mile of each other in a place we knew well was an extraordinary testing ground. Venice is a neighborhood with a rich history of both artistic and architectural experimentation and known for being a little odd, which is exactly what we love about it. Together with our client and a young chef named Jason Neroni, we built Superba Snack Bar based on the wonderfully wacky roots of Venice and infused that eccentric past into a new neighborhood hangout that feels both true to the Venice that had always been and embraces new directions. Superba Snack Bar, the first of the two restaurants, is small at only 1,500 square feet. And pushing the open extension of the patio to the very edge of the sidewalk gave the neighborhood street a key view straight into the open kitchen and all of the action. Venice is filled with tight-knit neighborhoods, including walk streets where neighbors often hang out in their front yards and casually drop in. This inspired the wall at the patio's edge, which was kept low to encourage conversation between diners and their neighbors passing by. The perimeter patio bench creates a comfortable and occupiable edge, which we covered in pool tile as a nod to summers in the 1970s and Venice Beach's Dogtown and Z-Boys. Or casual summer nights during the drought were historically spent gathering along the poolside edge, chatting with friends and skateboarding in empty pools. On the interior, we added some of the poolside grit by using rough exterior materials as finished materials, like raked stucco on the walls and concrete with large aggregate. Poncho blankets are used throughout the space as both upholstery and for wrapping up on foggy nights. These blankets were purchased directly from the Venice Beach boardwalk. As a nearby nod to the character, Jeff Spicoli in the 1980s movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. We built upon this idea when developing the branding and graphic design for Superba, allowing it to be both referential and artistic. Intentionally quirky, the handheld takeaway version of the menu directly connects the users back to their experience in the physical space. We extended this outside, punctuated moments on the exterior with signs that reference game pieces like Scrabble tiles and incorporate loosely hand-drawn versions of the Titer logo. Neon script and a supersized hand-painted loaf of bread overlap door openings, <coughs> which add both 2D wit to the exterior and an unexpected element of surprise. By positioning the graphic where it overlaps the doors below, we allow it to morph through use lines breaking and reconnecting as the doors open and close throughout the day. Superba Food and Bread is the larger neighborhood hub that includes an on-site bakery. The existing site was a decaying auto body shop surrounded by cars in disrepair, dilapidated fencing, and unexceptional additions on the east side of Lincoln Boulevard. It's a typical LA intersection between a high voltage thoroughfare and a quiet bungalow lined st residential street, which can often feel impenetrable by foot. The site provided us with the ideal opportunity to convert this static corner into a bright and lively one that is easily accessible by tearing off the building's useless appendages, we rid the site of its tacked on excess and broke it down to its skeleton, maintaining the existing garage bay penetrations, leaving pieces of its automotive history intact. We heavily integrated bold graphic moves on the exterior as a nod to some of our inspirations found in the prolific Venice Beach artist studios of the 60s and 70s, of painters like Ed Moses, the embedded artistic reference extends inside as we playfully mess with perceptions of materiality, visual weight, and proportion. At the corner coffee bar, 
we wanted to toy with our perceptions of light and heavy. By using materials like steel overhead and adding mirror underneath the bar, we flipped our common perceptions of visual weight topsy-turvy and use the mirror to reflect disembodied feet that seem to walk on into infinity. In opposition to this lightness, we constructed a visually soft but physically massive puffed bench nicknamed the cloud underneath the building's largest opening at the original garage door. Its placement allows the mass to spread through the wall and onto the patio, positioning guests back to back while some simultaneously inhabiting different worlds. From the exterior, the concrete cloud appears to have grown seamlessly from the ground, allowing it to continue a visual flow of material from the sidewalk back inside. The reference is massive yet playful. It is surprisingly solid in contrast to what soft edges might bring to mind. We set out to create places that are that delightfully surprise people so they want to include them in their daily rituals. And we received one of the greatest compliments when we found out that Ed Moses himself used to hang out there every morning. By reclaiming an old auto body shop and opening up the building to the street, we enabled Superba Food and Bread to create its own type of urban parkscape. It is transformative in its locale, energy, and function. On another tight corner lot in the Silver Lake neighborhood of LA, we created the first of five training centers for counterculture coffee. Counterculture off operates a unique business model in the coffee space. They roast wholesale, direct ship to consumer, and they build training centers where they educate the next generation of cutting edge coffee people. At the LA training center, we had the opportunity to create a different kind of workplace one that enabled them to host various classes of different sizes at multiple stations and really embrace the LA neighborhood. We were fortunate to discover an unused space between the building and its neighbor and knew that it was exactly what we needed to take over to create an indoor-outdoor classroom. Organized in a plus formation with two relatively equal axes, the interior of the space is activated in multiple directions and allows for maximum flexibility and connection to the outdoors. The primary education access is flooded with Southern California sunshine through the large glass <clears throat> pocketing sliding doors and connects seamlessly to the new outdoor amphitheater, taking full advantage of the formerly unused real estate. The addition of mirror at the top of the stadium seating provides a visual connection back to the classroom inside where the counterculture instructors work around a large central brewing station, which students are encouraged to gather around. The supporting role of the secondary axis off to the sides <clears throat> are de-emphasized and grayed out, allowing them to visually recess into the background. Multiple brewing stations have been arranged around a central, central element that we nicknamed the ziggurat, which acts both as a room divider and additional seating. By taking a common and humbly iconic material like colored fiberglass, often used as a cheap outdoor patio cover and highlighting its color and texture as an elevated design feature, we changed the perception of the material entirely. While the ziggurat could simply have been a partition, its added depth transforms it into something both highly functional when it's in place as well as when it's partially deconstructed. Within the ziggurat, we've hidden small cubes that can be pulled out as needed and used either as additional seating for classes or tables within the casual workplace, both carefully proportioned to maximize viewing height and flexibility. After the success in Los Angeles, we worked with Counterculture to develop four additional training centers throughout the United States, in Miami, Dallas, Seattle, and Washington, DC. We conceived each location as an extension of the brand with a unique concept that draws on the character of the surrounding neighborhood. Each space has the DNA of the company mission to educate people about coffee 
and to operate their business in a sustainable way, but with a unique personality that reflects an intersection of coffee drinking and culture. The Miami location is boldly graphic, with a central coffee bar that doubles as a classroom and a palette of natural materials painted in a tropical spray redolent of the highly social atmosphere of the city. In Dallas, we drew from the wide open vistas, colors of earth and sky, reflections of the strong sunlight and framed views, inspired by the minimalist sculptures of Donald Judd and their relationship to the West Texas landscape. Our work with clients who are expanding or growing a business now includes design for several next generation brick and mortar startups. Their business models are centered around improving customer experience on all levels, from the digital to physical space. We work with clients to create joyous and practical spatial environments that defy expectation. Modern Animal is a veterinary clinic designed to be a great place to work. In contrast to typical clinics, it's a truly transparent home for the co company's flagship, where visitors can see from the street straight through to the treatment areas. The curved wall of the wellness room creates a natural flow around the central focal point where everyday care will be seen and celebrated. Skylights throughout provide even daylight and connection to the natural circadian rhythms. The entire experience of visiting an animal clinic from entry to treatment has been equally considered. In our first space to delve into the human-animal relationship, we eliminated the barrier between the front customer area and the back of house using materiality, spatial adjacencies, and natural light to blur the line between traditionally separated zones. We've now worked with Modern Animal to open four locations since the pandemic began and are currently have 15 new locations in the works. The company has raised multiple rounds of venture capital funding and credits the physical space as a key component to their success. We work between scales within the fractal nature of cities where tiny interventions affect city blocks and bigger ideas infect the details. What began as an exploration into blurring boundaries between disciplines has evolved over time as we build and test new ways to expand the practice of architecture. Experimenting with strategies that enhance collective experience, we like to embed the intangible into the tactile. We are rebellious pragmatists, influenced by the ugly beauty and exaggerated sense of casualness in Los Angeles. Graphic space, inside, outside, layering, references, and spontaneity are all at play in our optimistic read on architecture's relationship to culture. We will continue to look for the weird and wonderful, feeding our curiosity with experimentation as we build new social spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have questions from the audience. And then I would do a final comment. But let's have questions first. Hi. Uh, thank you for your lecture. And um, this is Pooja. Uh, I was curious to know if, uh, because you're so, so <laughs> good. Because you have such an um, eccentric mix of the clientele, and if the name of your practice, Design Bridges, has any influence on or an effect on the demographic that you receive. Yes, I mean, we're sure it does. Uh, I think it, it's a good filter uh, for people because, you know, obviously there's a playfulness and there's an irreverence to it that. Um, client has to share, I would say. And um, yet, you know, when we came up with the name, it was part of a competition. It was not intended to be the name of an architecture firm. <laughs> um, 
but we realized quickly that it actually had, you know, it's a good conversation starter. Um, like at the bank or the building department, people always ask us, you know, what, what do you do? Why is that your name? Um, so it's, yeah, it's definitely probably has led to uh, an interesting mix of clients. Sorry, I had just one before. Um, also, the colors that you use, they were quite, quite eclectic and seemed very specific to each project, even though um, you're designing uh, coffee places or community centers or co-working co spaces. So is there a, I'm curious as to if that's, a, like if there's a certain palette that you pre-decide or just work through with the... No, I mean, obviously we, we like working with color and it, you know, it, we know that it, um, it has strong effect on perception. And um, so we, we play with it depending on you know what the appropriate <laughs> um, use seems to be. In some of the projects, the newer projects that are more brand specific, they may be drawn from the palette, uh, the branding palette that's established by the company. But for the most part, um, it's just something that evolves through the design process and depends on what the goals are and the inspirations and you know, the qualities of light that are in the building, if it's an existing building that we're using. Um, so I wouldn't say there's any predetermined idea that we have about what the colors would be, or, or even if there is a lot of color, usually there is, but not always. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for coming out here Hi. to talk to us tonight. Um, I'm curious to know You've, as a student in Los Angeles, and now as a practitioner in the city, you've been both, uh, you've been in multiple stakeholder roles at this point now, you know? Uh, at some point, you're that student who's like, oh, I want that new cool place to open, and I want, I want more of these places now. Now you're making them. And I'm curious to know, from your cohort, from your generation, what, um, what sort of conversations now are going on about your your urban insertions, your urban interventions, the state of the city, um, what you're doing now and what can be done more. Because it seems to me that there are more and more uh, similarly sized, let's say teams, such as yourself, who are pushing this, these smaller scale, but very, uh, let's say very sensitive, very effective insertions. <laughs> That's a question with a long answer, <laughs> or maybe not an answer. <laughs> a, uh, a point for discussion. Um, so w when I first moved to Los Angeles, it was 1991, um, I attended UCLA as an undergrad just for one year. Then I left and came back and left and came back. But it's interesting because it, LA is very different than it was then but also the same in some ways. Um, at that time, before I knew that I was really interested in architecture, um, I was studying philosophy, so <laughs> totally unrelated. Um, exploring LA was more about like seeing these, finding these places that had been there forever, that were really gritty. Um, there was just, you know, what felt like a lot of, um, just a lot of space that no attention was being paid to in a way. Um, and then now, you know, fast forward to there's a lot of development um, and there's a lot of um, what's the word? rehabilitation of buildings also, which is great. There's a lot more, there's a lot more new spaces and more interesting design spaces. Um, and I would say that there's, it's a positive thing, like there's definitely been um, a lot of, there's so, you know, so many creative people in LA, all different types, right? There's movie industry, there's fabricators, there's now there's tech, um, digital creators, and there's artists, and I mean, there's just a, a, a lot of creative energy in the city, and so it's great to see that energy kind of um, influencing the built environment. There's also a lot of, you know, 
bad development that's happening that's not high quality. Um, and I think the discussions that are happening, um, probably on the one hand, they're optimistic because of this creative uh, environment and because clients are, you know, sometimes willing to take chances or to, to be more open than maybe they would be in another city. Um, but then there's also the challenges of everything is becoming more expensive. It's really hard to open a business. It's really hard to do anything. Um, so for these smaller offices, you know, like us and like a lot of other smaller offices, it's, you know, a constant battle to get anything done. Um, so I don't know. I think it's, it's both optimistic and challenging at the same time. Sounds like a fun place to be in. So thank you. Hi, Rebecca, thank you for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would like to ask a question regarding your project that has to do with ADUs, additional dwelling units. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that you are, in a sense, designing a product that you sell, but it's still a building. Uh, how would you, if this project scales up and you end up doing a large amount of these things, how do you actually charge the client? Um, because you, you're building a building in their backyard, but at the same time, it's kind of prefab, and as an architect, I feel that in these cases, you could end up um, on the short end of the stick where someone takes your design and basically goes all over with it. Thanks. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, and actually, so we, what happened in this case is that we, the first, the midnight room that we built, we actually built it before the standard plan program started. Um, so that was a, you know, it was a com custom commission for clients. And then we were invited to be part of the standard plan program, and we thought, this is great. You know, it can improve density in the city. Um, the quality of design for these ADUs can maybe, you know, go up. Um, it, we had never participated in any kind of standard plan program before where it's pre-approved, and permitting is really difficult in Los Angeles, so we thought this is a gr great opportunity. Um, However, <laughs> a couple things have happened during the course of that process that have made it so that, in fact, we don't have any <laughs> other of those projects built yet. We have many, many inquiries, but so um, one for, we discovered that for liability reasons, uh, we can't just sell the plans. I mean, even if we wanted to, which we may not anyway is a question, but um, because we're licensed architects um, and because we're not building them ourselves, we can't, we have to treat it kind of as though it's a, a full service project. Um, so the clients would have to hire us for, you know, permitting and for construction administration while it's being built. Um, and so that is something that because of our own, the way our practice is set up, we're not offering to clients a low fee. Uh, you know, the fee that we would propose is somewhere less than what the custom fee was, but it's not super low. Um, and I think it's likely that the prefab people who are participating in the program, because there are some that are manufacturers, uh, it's probably working better for them because they can just sell it. I mean, they sell the whole thing. They sell the, pro the construction and the design together. Uh, we can't do that. We don't really want to do it. So... For that reason, we don't have tons of them. Um, the other reason is that construction costs in Los Angeles have gone up uh, a huge amount in the last year or two. I'm sure it's happened everywhere in the world because of supply chain and labor issues. But So it's quite expensive to build one of these. Um, and most people that inquire don't have the budget to do it. So it's it's... It's a promising idea, and we really hope that people, you know, we're, it's great that the city has, is allowing it to happen. Um, but I think my guess is that for architects, it's probably not going to lead to a lot of projects. It's probably going to be mostly prefab 
people who are doing it. There are some firms like uh, T Linda Tallman and her It House. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with it. It's sort of a kit house um, that she designed that's made out of aluminum. Um, it's a really beautiful kind of project. She, um, you know, she does the architecture, but she also sells the components. I know that she's got several of them uh, in process. And I think that business model makes more sense than, yeah. Um, if the prefab people are selling the house, are they also doing the permitting? Yeah, they do the permitting, they build it, they do everything. Okay. Yeah. And they, um, I think some of them probably have architects on staff and others have like collaborated with architects to create the designs. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, um, thank you so much for your uh, lecture. Um, I'm just curious because I can see that you are working closely with entrepreneurs and it seems like um, it's not like they come to you and hire you, but it's more like collaborate, collaborate work. So I'm, I'm curious in terms of how is the approach or the balance between um, brand business from entrepreneur's perspective and your uh, designs propositions of like, how is it balanced between these two language of business and architecture, and especially you also working closely with like graphic designer or a specific group of people like a skateboarder? Hmm. It depends on the client, you know, obviously as to how like the collaborative process works. Um, with the entrepreneurs, um, in some cases, they've come to us without really an idea of what the physical space is going to be. And so they might be, like with Modern Animal, they were actually just in the beginning of starting the company um, when we met them. And they said, okay, we found the space, we signed a lease. You know, we don't, <laughs> we have to start, but we don't know what we need yet. And they were also working on their, their app and their digital, you know, their software and all of the other stuff at the same time. Um, so essentially that process was kind of us meeting every week with the whole team, you know, everyone in the company at that time, and like helping them figure out what, what the space is, um, both from like an operations perspective and how it should feel and how it can you know, work with the, help the customer experience. Um, and then since then, Several of the other projects that we're working on are actually kind of tangentially related to modern animals. So they might be people who have, you know, they have investors in common or um, someone that works with modern animal works with this, is starting another company. So we have, um, we've kind of had the experience of working together and then we can, we have a, a sort of a shared language of how to talk about um, developing the brand and the space together at the same time. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, if not, I would just like to wrap up, I think, a kind of observation or commentary. Um, I very much appreciate the work of the practice. Um, I think it is real, it is sincere, it crosses a bunch of different kinds of thresholds and it's, let's say, a different kind of practice than maybe we would normally have in this kind of lecture series. I mean, the scale of work is my, yes, I know I need to talk into the microphone, sorry. <laughs> um, a scale of work that is very much attainable, um, aspirational for our student audience, um, you know, that's, I, you know, I just would like to underscore that, so it's been great to have you here to present that. Um, I was also just sort of reflecting, I don't know, maybe a question will come out of this or not, is that so much of this work I see as building on the shoulders of a kind of LA scene of the 80s, early to mid 90s, let's say, um, you know, which parallels you know, I think with, you know, we're similar ages of education and what it meant to work in LA or 
what LA was before something like the Disney Concert Hall or the Broad. And there's a kind of freshness here in the work um, that builds upon those established legacies, but it's also a kind of counter project to that kind of work that is now happening. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, well, before the Guggenheim Bilbao, you know, the Disney Concert Hall would never have gotten built. That, you know, that was designed before Guggenheim. And then Gary finally, you know, is able to realize it afterwards, changing the uh, stone facade to uh, titanium or metal or whatever it is, zinc. Um, so anyways, this kind of doing this kind of work is a kind of counterbalance to all those things that are now being absorbed into LA. And I find it just, um, yeah, I find it very nice. So with all the echoes of what makes LA architecture, LA architecture, uh, uh, so dare I say a kind of vernacular without the kind of importation of googly forms and um, things that are kind of outside that kind of, let's say, uh, what is it, Los Angelino scale? Am I, is that the correct adjective? Um, I haven't thought about using that in a while. Anyways, so that's just a kind of comment. I, I um, yeah, I mean, I wish you um, and Kathy all the best in uh, growing your practice because we have a very much a discussion here uh, about what is architecture and yes, we do believe that it is design, bitches. So thank you. Thank you.